Okay, so hello everyone and a very, very warm welcome to all of you. I would firstly like to thank all of you for being a part of Global Fintech Fest, an event organized by Fintech Convergence Council of IMAI and National Payments Corporation of India, presented by the Department of Economics, Ministry of Finance, Reserve Bank of India, powered by Amazon Pay and by WhatsApp and Google Pay. With that, I would like to now move on to our next session of the day. Next up, we have a trialogue on the topic post-COVID investments in fintech. That I would like to introduce you to our panelists. First up, we have our moderator, Mr. Varun Mittal, Emerging Markets Fintech Lead EY. And the other panelists include Mr. Nobutake Suzuki, Chief Executive Officer, MUFG Innovation Partners, Mr. Dirk Mark Wakabeke, Managing Partner, Founder, BNX PTE, Alps Ventures, and Mr. Arvind Sankaran, former VC, Jungle Ventures, and Senior Advisor, McKinsey and Company. We would like to welcome all of you, and I would now request Mr. Mittal to please take over the session. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you everyone for joining us today this evening. I would start, I'd like to start with talking a bit about what has happened post COVID from an investment landscape. Globally, we have seen uh, some sectors facing a lot of crunch, some sectors, uh, some sectors becoming most loved by the venture capitalist this season. There have been protectionism in some countries around specific sectors. And we would like to ask our panelists to share a bit about their background on what are they doing and what are they looking in the post-COVID sector before we jump into specific questions for them. Uh, so Suki-san, may I start with you about your views and how uh, MUFG is looking at these things and how MUFG Innovate is uh, operating in this segment now? Yeah, thank you much for introduction. Hi, I'm uh, Nobutake Suzuki, CEO and the president of uh, MLG Innovation Partners, which is a uh, uh, corporate venture, venture capital fund for MLG. And uh, as you might know, MLG is the largest banking group in Japan, but also MLG has deployed their business in uh, uh, you know major countries like uh, US, uh, Southeast Asia, and also into the Asia and the EU countries. And uh, our fund is uh, specifically, specifically focused on the fintech companies. And uh, we uh, usually allocate our 80% of investment in the foreign uh, startups, which include the US, uh, Southeast Asia, and uh, also EMEA countries like Israel. Yeah. Thank you. Doug? Doug? Yeah. Sure. yeah. 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 Um, do you mind going on mute, Arun? There's a bit of an echo on your side. Thanks. Um, hi, everyone. Dirk van Kwakbeke here, one of uh, the managing partners at BNEXT. BNEXT is a Singapore domiciled fund investing in India, Southeast Asia, and Japan. FinTech is a big focus of ours. We usually invest early, so seed stage up to A, sometimes B round. We have by now backed uh, 180 companies. Um, yes, we're a small team. Uh, that's a different story, how we managed to do that. But um, we have been a super huge fan of uh, Indian entrepreneurship and continue to be, be in that position even now during these hard times and, and beyond. Arvind? Thanks, Varun, for having me on this panel, uh, most illustrious uh, panelists with me. I'm looking forward to the discussion. As for myself, I'm a former retail banker and uh, I've kind of gained operating experience in the payments, lending and wealth, having spent over two decades uh, in uh, ASEAN. And uh, most recent five years have been uh, deeply immersed in the Southeast Asia and India uh, startup ecosystem. Uh, you know, working at uh, Jungle Ventures initially with the portfolio companies and then subsequently as a venture partner looking at uh, the investments uh, lens more closely in the domain that I'm associated with. Currently, I'm a senior advisor at uh, McKinsey with the Asia Banking Practice Group and we look at incumbents in ASEAN and how they are interacting with the fintech ecosystem to actually build out their digital capabilities. Uh, always a tech enthusiast, consider myself a fintech geek these days super excited uh, about this event and i my only message at this stage of the uh, discussion is i think we may run the risk of overestimating the negative impact in the short run and underestimating the impact of fintech as a force for good in the long term and i hope i can build on that hypothesis as we go along thanks for having me thank you as you mentioned about uh how banks are collaborating with fintechs. 
uh, Suzuki san, if you could share that uh, the, the biggest deal in Southeast Asia, India combined in the last six to nine months has been the MUFG deal for 700 million US dollars with the Grab Holdings. Uh, if you could share in terms of how do you guys see as one of the largest anchors, and I don't think any bank in the region has done something of this size. If you could share your views around how do you see that collaboration going forward? And do you see something of, of that sort emerging in India soon as well? Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, yes, uh, MFG and also MFG Innovation Partner jointly invest in Grab, and uh, uh, the amount is, uh, you know, Seven hundred million dollars, which is quite big, you know, investment for us. But anyway, so you know, and also you know, after the investment, so we became first choice bank for Grab, which means uh, uh, we are going to provide the various kind of finance services over the uh, platform. Let's say like uh, maybe uh, we are going to provide uh, loans to uh, drivers and also merchant on the platform. And uh, uh, so let me explain detail of the collaboration and uh, uh, you know. MLG has uh, four uh, subsidiary banks in uh, Southeast, Southeast Asia, which include uh, Indonesia, Thailand, uh, Philippines, Vietnam. And uh, so in each country, country so our subsidiary bank uh, has worked as a grab regarding the, uh, you know, provision of various kind of finance service to uh, uh, grabs, you know, drivers and merchants in uh, each local market. But also, uh, Grab has an uh, uh, advantage of, uh, let's say, you know, artificial intelligence because uh, uh, Grab maybe, you know, I think maybe they have uh, more than 400 engineers in the AI space to develop uh, various kind of, uh, uh, you know, systems based on the AI and the machine learning uh, to maybe uh, make uh, efficient, you know, arrangement of uh, drivers and so on. And uh, MLG want to maybe uh, uh, take advantage of this, you know, uh, their resources in the AI space. So uh, basically, so MLG's Tokyo headquarter is starting to work with the Grab regarding the, you know, uh, usage of uh, AI technologies. So in uh, inside the MLG. So let's say maybe uh, we have seen various kind of application, like uh, maybe creating a new uh, credit scoring models who are using their technologies in uh, anti-money laundering space and so on. So that, that's a whole picture of uh, our collaboration with Grab. That's really insightful to see the level of collaboration you're building with Super App. So for our listeners who may be wondering what Grab is, it's think of it like a Ola plus Paytm, uh, plus a bit of food, food panda uh, for Southeast Asia. <laughs> Yeah, that yeah, probably yeah. is the most that probably is the most simplistic uh, yes, explanation yes. I could make for our Indian listeners. Uh, the other question I had was around when it looks at the sectors which are uh, going to face a lot more interest. Are there specific sectors uh, which uh, Dirk, you uh, and uh, Suzuki San, you're looking where there is a lot more action coming in because of the post-COVID realities? And how do you see that shaping up for long term? Like, is it a short term hype or a long term play? Uh, Dirk, how are you looking at what's hot now? <laughs> so I think uh, I think I alluded to that uh, like before the talk, actually, right? Um, so I think I, I try to think abstract and um, break it down for myself in in quadrants, you know, BCG matrix, uh, and and what 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 are really the like what has changed and what are the permanent sort of shifts in behavior or in how business is going to be done in the future and which of these uh, areas are being accelerated. Um, and I think, I mean, in the short term, we see obviously gaming and other forms of digital entertainment going through the roof simply because there's a lot of, uh, a lot of um, activity um, or a lot of time being spent online these days. I think, more interestingly, I'm asking myself, what are the second order implications of sort of the hype cycles? So let's say everybody's going to shop online from here going forward. What are the secondary implications, right? And I think payments is a huge benefactor um, of the same in, in, in payments and infrastructure, anything in fintech that supports the digital economy. And then is it a sort of like layer, if you layer it on top of each other, anything at the bottom of the stack is very, very interesting and very de-risk as well. Um, but I think there are also new categories being, being born. Um, another area maybe, and then I stop, is really 
the digitalization of any workflow in retail, right? So like, uh, like the Kiriana stores will not stop to exist. Um, the question is how can they reinvent themselves and, and a lot of that has to do with software. Um, so I think, I think it's a great time. Sometimes we don't realize, I think, because we live in this world, right? How privileged we are. But I think even in our industry, we will go and look back at 2020 as a major catalyst event for fintech, but for commerce online and, and digital transformation in general. So I think it's a phenomenal time to invest and be part of this ecosystem. That, that's great. Uh, and Suzuki san, how do you see, see like what's the hot sector for you now? Yeah, uh, as I mentioned, basically our fund is uh, focused on the fintech space. So maybe uh, I want to maybe talk maybe inside the fintech sectors. But uh, uh, you know, uh, basically, so we of course closely work with MFG itself, and uh, still in Japan, maybe majority of maybe banking services are based on uh, offline interaction in branches. And of course, we have, uh, let's say, mobile banking apps or, uh, of course, internet banking. But uh, let's say some of maybe procedures should be done uh, with uh, maybe uh, relationship manager in branches. And uh, now banks face maybe uh, need to maybe uh, change such a uh, maybe uh, offline interaction uh, to uh, maybe online basis. So uh, let's say maybe a typical case is uh, maybe EKYC. And uh, so uh, actually, maybe uh, we still rely on uh, maybe, uh, uh, you know, uh, meeting maybe uh, new clients in person in branches, but uh, we need to maybe uh, move to, uh, let's say, uh, video based maybe KYC. Uh, and also, maybe, uh, uh, I think maybe uh, we see uh, more issues in, uh, uh, you know, B2Bs and B2C. And uh, banking with SMEs and also large enterprises are more complicated than maybe uh, banking with the consumers. So let's say uh, if you think about maybe uh, banking service to large enterprises, uh, still maybe majority of services are maybe uh, served by uh, relationship managers, but uh, uh, we need to change that. And, and uh, so maybe uh, let's say uh, we might need to maybe uh, use uh, maybe blockchain technology in uh, maybe let's say trade finance, or uh, uh, we need to maybe uh, digitalize our maybe, uh, uh, let's say, uh, you know, uh loan procedure to large enterprises and the various kind of things and and uh so i think maybe uh, now maybe uh not only MLG but also all japanese banks need to transform them, themselves into a more uh digitalized organization and uh, in order to do so i, I think banks need uh, maybe a collaboration with uh, fintech companies you know so that's a current situation that I see a lot of opportunities, you know, in uh, maybe uh, fintech companies which can provide a uh, uh, base kind of solution to uh, incumbent banks. Well, that's very helpful. And I wanted to ask one controversial question, Doc would hate me for it. Uh, in terms of uh, the wave of protectionism you see coming around, uh, there are firewalls being created by countries. One view is that it will create new local IP, new local technologies. The other view is it will create a large number of subscale clones, which ultimately would not help uh, the local sector. And because you guys have seen these trends across the world, what do you see the this kind of banning of specific apps and local protectionism coming around uh, for investors as well as companies uh, in these markets? Uh, and how do you see that going forward? Because some of that has been much recent phenomena in most markets. So, Doug, to start with you first. I'll, I'll take that head on. Okay. <laughs> um, do you mind going on mute? Sorry, there's an echo. Um, so, in short, I'll dodge the question and I'll answer it just with a, or a counter it with a question, right? Who, what, what is similar to a market like China and what is different uh, in India nowadays? And if you compare the digitalization of and the market, cre market cap created between US, which was an innovator and a front runner, China and Europe, which had a very open policy um, to larger incumbents. And what has that led to in terms of market cap, right? And I think a lot of learning can be withdrawn there. And I think the other thing is 
there is, I mean, it's in a way it's ludicrous that that um, digital trade has been an exception to the rule because this has been around for ages that there is a trade, we have bilateral trade agreements on any physical good that moves the country. But when it comes to digital attention, digital consumption, it somehow doesn't exist, right? And it doesn't exist in Europe either or at a very, very small base in comparison to physical goods movement. So that just poses questions to me. I don't have a good answer. You know, I think there are fair questions, fair reactions. We are at the moment a benefactor of um, some of the more recent digital um, blockings of Chinese apps in India, simply because we back local entrepreneurs and especially on the content side. I think anybody that builds anything in content has seen a surge in their numbers. Um, but I think it's an open debate and I think it's, it's, it's a very long debate that has a lot of different levels to touch up on. And Suzuki-san, how do you see that? Because there are, because you would have broader views around that from a Japanese as well as so somebody focused on ASEAN in India? Yeah, I think maybe uh, Japan, Japan maybe uh, is in a very difficult position. And because uh, we are very close to China and but also economically, we are also has a very close relationship with the US. And uh, specifically, maybe regarding M MFG, MFG has a large business in the States, but also we have a large operation in China too. A and uh, so maybe we, we need to balance maybe uh, those maybe our, our countries and, uh, you know, not by MFG, but also maybe as a country. And uh, uh, I think maybe, uh, you know, uh, let, let's say maybe, uh, you know, uh, So maybe, uh, but uh, I can say maybe Japan is in a very unique position because uh, uh, we can be a kind of maybe an intermediator between maybe uh, uh, these maybe two maybe uh, countries. And uh, so maybe uh, we might also maybe take advantage of such a position too. So it might maybe uh, sound weird, but uh, uh, that's uh, maybe uh, uh, you know way maybe Japanese maybe uh, Japan or maybe Japanese companies can maybe uh, how can I say maybe take advantage, maybe, you know, yeah. I don't know this uh, maybe uh, you are maybe uh, it's answer to your question, but uh, yeah. yeah. So fully, fully, fully see the, I mean, I see the bright light on that, that uh, Japan could actually be a winner out of all of this by being the uh, neutral party and having good relationship with the, almost everybody from that perspective. Uh, the, the other question I had was regarding the current challenges in terms of, uh, some entrepreneurs are facing this challenge that should they take down rounds or should they uh, for extending their runway or should they cut their size so some startups are looking at layoffs and saying okay keep survive live to fight another day so that's one school of thought and other school of thought is double down in this period because others will go out so from those like and that few different schools of thoughts as well so do you see do you guys see at least in your portfolios where are what's the priority like one is cut down whatever is bare minimum and live to fight another day versus doubling down and uh, using that to scale up at this time because the others are down uh and suzuki san maybe just starting from you that uh, do you see any specific preference in your portfolio as your portfolio managers as well as as an investor from your side yeah i think maybe uh you know under the current circumstance maybe uh, uh i haven't seen any down rounds uh, in my portal companies yet because uh, my portal companies are well funded by, uh, uh, you know, top tier VCs in uh, various countries. Uh, so I'm very much comfortable with the maybe current situation, but also maybe uh, personally I see maybe uh, some startups maybe, uh, you know, which have uh, difficulties and especially maybe if you are in a weaker position and uh, you only have maybe, uh, uh, you know, very short term, maybe runway. Uh, in some cases, maybe you have to accept maybe uh, uh, you know disfavor maybe your condition uh, by investors. And uh, but uh, I I think maybe uh, if you see about if you think about maybe top tier startups in each sector, maybe uh, they are kind of maybe immune to uh, maybe current situation and uh, they still maintain their maybe uh, uh, variation. 
and under the current circumstances, maybe, uh, you know, but maybe uh, they can also maybe take money from Ibiza with a very, you know, good conditions. And uh, I think maybe, uh, but uh, also maybe uh, it is important for maybe entrepreneurs now to maybe, uh, uh, you know, maybe uh, you, you have to see maybe current situation maybe, uh, you know, in a maybe longer term maybe prospect because uh, we used to think maybe a current maybe COVID-19 situation might end soon. But reality is uh, maybe uh, it might maybe uh, take longer time to maybe uh, go back to uh, maybe normal maybe uh, uh, situation. So it might last, I don't know, but maybe at least maybe 18 to 24 months to maybe uh, go back to maybe normal situation. So which means that uh, maybe uh, we should be cautious and we should be prepared for maybe such a maybe worst scenario. So, and uh, in order to maybe prepare for maybe such a circumstance, maybe uh, obviously may I recommend maybe my portal companies to maybe uh, pay attention to maybe every, every ex expense and also every new investment. So that, that's my idea. Uh, Arun, uh, uh, Suzuki-san shared very uh, specific that uh, he's advising his portfolio companies to be prepared for 18 to 24 month uh, uh time before things are normal or close to normal and are prone the expenses and stuff what are you looking in your portfolio and the companies you work with and are you advising some similar timelines yeah i think the uh if you you know use a framework and i like dirk's approach to these things you know uh, try and have a framework and look at things through that i think there are uh, three participants to this whole economy you have the state uh, which are, you know, governments and nations building infrastructure and providing, you know, kind of relief measures and subsidies and investment capital. Then you have the uh, market, which is, uh, you know, essentially investors who are kind of helping with the uh, with the risk capital. And then you have the, uh, you know, the, the players or the communities, the founders and the marketplaces that they, you know, uh, live in and create ideas and create value. And if you use that and look at each one of the for the founders, what we are advising is no different from you know what uh, you know Dirk or Nobutra Kesan uh, mentioned. I think it's about uh, you know conserving capital, keeping cash you know really precious. And uh, I think it, uh, sectors vary uh, where uh, demand has been hit. Uh, obviously, you know one has to look very carefully at uh, you know uh, what are the current projects to build tech, to build partnerships, to build. A business development and really you know uh, uh, wisely use budgets there and also at the same time look at data coming through on demand formation because surely demand will return in some shape or form i don't expect that the behavior will swing to one and it, there will be a reversion it's just we don't know how much will there be a permanent loss of uh, demand so to speak in some of those sectors so i think that's something that one has to be uh, cautious about so that's uh, as far as the uh, you know founders are concerned. I think it's uh, like someone mentioned the fixed cost is a difficult you know kind of challenge to deal with, and a big chunk of fixed cost is people, and uh, therefore you know having to make some very tough uh, trade-offs uh, in terms of uh, rationalizing your fixed cost is what challenge I guess founders are most kind of concerned about. Uh, but they need to make those difficult decisions to live to fight another day. So that's the uh, advice. Uh, that you know is uh, coming across the board but i think yet there is a constructive view and that's what we were talking about before we got into this panel which i think you know in the longer term there is i think uh, definitely vcs uh, don't want to waste this crisis so to speak so i think there is a keen eye on emerging uh, opportunities so certainly you know either the very early who are still kind of busy building product or the ones who are at a later stage so if you look at singapore for example the fintech ecosystem raised uh, almost 500 million Singapore dollars in the first half of 2020. And that's at almost 20% growth year on year. And if you double click on that, while the deal count may have been flat or a bit lower, the average deal size has gone up. What that says is that we're looking at a, you know, the market moving towards a, a C round. And that means there is a you know growing maturity of the fintech ecosystem. So I think we will see that kind of happen on the on the VC uh, side. On the players and the founders, I think there's a great opportunity beyond this. And we were talking about, you know, the whole thesis shifting, in particular India, where India is leading in many ways in how uh, this space is uh, being looked at as a public good. I think the government has uh, identified, uh, you know, building infrastructure in this as a public good. We're putting it alongside health and education as other traditional sectors that 
receive this kind of uh, you know support from the government and there's a big push now for private sector innovation to build on top of the you know the public good infrastructure of course there is a you know a healthy debate even yesterday there was one on how do uh, how does the private uh, innovator get compensated for taking risk to build you know commercially viable innovation on top of this public infrastructure but i think that's where i think there's going to be an excitement going forward and to that extent i see uh, out of this i think sectors like retail beginning to re uh, orient themselves to the next 500 million i think we will look at a lot more deeper penetration to tier 2 tier 3 you know markets i think there will be a, a reversion to the community i think that's going to be a big play and therefore i think for me the big theme that i've been watching over the last few years is kirana and their role in lo local communities we have 13 million kiranas in india accounting for 90% of retail trade which is something like 400 billion they've always remained profitable uh, in their low margin business they have the trust of communities and there are a number of companies like snapbase khata book jumbo tea and all these are digitizing stores and then you have larger companies like metro who are disrupting the you know the 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 way uh, wholesalers have traditionally supplied to them and fmcg brands are now coming in very strongly because these this sector is no longer data dark there is transaction analytics and data available so i think that convergence and going to the next uh, 500 million i think is going to be a very strong uh, kind of push that i'm excited about that i see founders moving to that's perfect and duck uh, coming to you on that so do you see like where uh, in terms of like he specifically mentioned or been mentioned opportunity so do you see firstly do you see already cutting down the cost down rounds and uh, layoffs becoming the norm in your portfolio is in their specific sectors and peers and specifically like what's the next pillar and or, or next target they are looking at to live to fight another day yeah sure um i think a few points maybe number one when when we reacted on this and we said um to contextualize it very very early right and the stack that means our average runway before you started raising was maybe 3 to 6 month historically pre covid and you would be usually okay if you are a good to great company um i think now i would advise companies to start thinking about fundraising a little bit earlier that's one so i think everybody's getting much like a cold start engine right like every, every piece has to work together and has to start simultaneously and that includes seed round investors and then later stage investors warming up so we have started writing checks again that's a good news um like we were busy the first 4 or 5 weeks with a lot of portfolio work and just preparing founders what is to come as good as we can given that again we said very very early in the life cycle of a company number one a lot of the folks who are maybe in the early stage of their venture journey have not seen a crisis before and what that means and how that can play out right so it's just sharing experience and sharing insights and some of them like we can't blame them for that that's why we back them right founders are by nature super optimistic so sometimes you had to deliver the message not once but like a few more times that this is real and it's going to slow down but what is really encouraging is is uh, number one also we all look for hope right so we look for light at the end of the tunnel and a lot of that from a venture perspective is also public markets has actually performed extraordinarily well especially in our digital asset class whether it's saas payment you name it right search engines the fangs etc so i think that's a great signal for i think again we don't realize because we have been working in this ecosystem of digital myself for 15 20 years so i don't know anything else but i know that there's an external world and we're we're really in a very very exciting space at a very exciting time and yes we have a short i think there's a short window of from an investor perspective maybe of opportunity to cut sort of like down rounds and what what have you but i think fundamentally i'm a believer in multi round games so when you invest and you're part of the ecosystem you don't build relationship on one company you build relationships over many years many companies with founders with the ecosystem with co-investors with referrers with angel you name it so if you want to be smart about it and even like great companies were in tough spots i think you have a chance to make a name for yourself for good 
by standing by the founder and actually supporting wherever you can. So for us, it meant really, and I'm going to end there, the first six weeks of the crisis was standing with the founders very, very, very closely and essentially managing your losses. Okay, and just reorienting yourself and thinking, okay, what can we do if we have to extend runway, etc. Lots of board meetings, lots of budget discussions, and many founders had to re-slice their budget probably 15 times in the last four months, you know? So, so that's the reality of it, right? We wish it was different, but that's the reality. And um, the second phase then, and there I really have to celebrate again sort of the innovation and the jugad and the 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 ability to be creative uh, on the spot of founders. Um, the second phase was really maybe four to eight weeks of gaining ground. So they figured out, hey, it's not as bad as it looks. This is the way forward. Yes, we might have to cut a little bit, but actually there's a lot of good news in this crisis as well. And then what we're going into now is actually what I fear. I don't want to say fear most, but I think which may be the most challenging is accepting that this might take a lot longer than we all hope and we all really have to be able to sell online whether we are an enterprise company or not and um i hope it's going to be very short but I, like we like the companies that had cut can no cut further so they have to raise and we have to find a way to underwrite new checks for new companies to not wipe out entire cohorts right so if this goes on for another 18 months some companies will really struggle so like cash preservation is is for sure the prudent thing to do that's very helpful and, and a related question to that is do you see the expansion plans being cut down because of this so for example uh asean companies who are looking to enter to india or other asean markets or indian companies who are trying to go so have you seen that uh, cut down on expansion plans in some shape either by yeah. country or by pr product verticals and stuff yeah. so and short for sure um but i think it's it's too much of a blanket question and answer right so you have pockets in your portfolio that have benefited tremendously you have pockets which really have to watch out for how they spend um so in short yes i've seen both Ta massive tailwinds doubling down trying to gain market share um I, I have also seen sort of like in the medium i have seen very healthy retention in SaaS company and expansion within your existing portfolio sets i've seen also in SaaS companies and we invest in japan as well actually record months being hit every month in SaaS in japan right so like so like it depends on country. Vietnam had zero cases. Japan is realizing it has to digitalize very quickly. Uh, India is in a very hard lockdown situation. So I think it really like the lead indicator is how COVID is expanding in that country and how people are thinking from a business mindset perspective. And then obviously, you know, like fundamental, like how, what's the GDP per capita? What's the GDP for the country? But I stopped there. Um, would love to hear yeah. also Suzuki and um, Arvind's company. Exactly, Suzuki-san. What do you what do you feel from that perspective? Because uh, Doug mentioned about Japan, uh, and you look at rest of Southeast Asia as well. Do you see like changes in expansion plan and what's driving them upwards or downwards? Yeah, actually, yes. Uh, I think maybe Japan and maybe your. Uh, you know, startups in Japan also maybe Southeast Asia a bit different, and, and uh, maybe uh, let me explain about maybe uh, uh, Southeast Asian startups. And we have a uh, a few portal companies in uh, Southeast Asia, which include Grab. Uh, Grab is an exception, but uh, uh, you know, uh, actually, you know, there's a one company which headquartered in Malaysia, and uh, also they have operation in uh, uh, Indonesia and also Thailand. But obviously, maybe, uh, uh, you know, currently, maybe uh, these countries maybe uh, uh, used to have a very strict, maybe a local situation, and now maybe uh, coming back to a normal, maybe a situation. But, uh, uh, you know, the startup maybe uh, has a very limited resources to maybe, so they have to maybe, uh, you know, reduce maybe uh, the expansion plan a little bit. And uh, uh, they used to have a more ambitious plan to maybe expand to maybe whole ASEAN countries, you know. But now maybe they have to maybe uh, uh, you know reshape the, maybe their past plan, and now maybe they have more conservative plan maybe under current situation. That is uh, just maybe one example. And uh, also maybe uh, uh, 
regarding maybe Japanese startups, maybe, uh, uh, you know, uh, I think maybe, uh, you know, obviously maybe uh, uh, under the constitution, maybe you, you can't maybe go abroad, maybe, uh, uh, you know, and uh, so maybe uh, uh, they have to maybe scale back the uh, maybe initial plan about the global expansion too. But uh, uh, more importantly, maybe Japanese startups maybe uh, tend to focus on domestic market because uh, we have a, you know, third largest, largest maybe economy and uh, we have a 110 million people here. And uh, so maybe uh, that is a kind of maybe tendency of Japanese company, but uh, they, you know, focus on the domestic and uh, they have a less ambitious maybe plan to go global. But, but anyways, that is a current situation, I think. Pardon, just to add, I think there is, uh, you know, I think some of the companies are building muscle during this period, and it's not necessarily about expansion. While, of course, the next market and, and ASEAN, you know, many companies have looked to scale into either Philippines or Vietnam as the next uh, markets. There may be some re-timing of some of that. Uh, but there is a lot of focus on developing new capabilities and strengths. So it could be either in terms of developing their, you know, uh, engineering capability. There's a lot of people out there. Talent pools are now available, uh, you know, as the community comes together and there are, uh, you know, companies who are in a position to hire specific engineering and tech skills. So they are building that muscle. There are others who are strengthening their, uh, you know, balance sheet access, for example, if they're a lender, they need to diversify sources of working capital. Whereas earlier you may have relied on an NBFC or you know one particular source of uh, balance sheet, uh, the real learning is that you now you need to diversify for a long term, you know, robust, low cost of uh, working capital to be ready when the recovery comes to really be able to you know capture and ride that growth. So I think that's uh, I would qualify you know uh, the observation in that sense. We use that analogy actually a lot. We, we say invest in the boat for the wind to come back and your sailboat, right? So now is the time, you have some time. I think that was really the phase one and two. I think now people are starting to get a little bit nervous how long is this going to be. So I think the first six months was a lot of like that investing. Uh, but at some point people, like in our portfolio, they, they are also like aggressively pursuing how to figure out how to sell in, in this um, social distancing world, if you will, you know, to, to make revenue as well come in. Thank you. Thank you, Dirk. And we, as we are approaching towards the end of the panel, I wanted to bring one of the audience questions. We see most of the fintech investment going towards payments and lending. And uh, Suzuki-san also mentioned about uh, lending to drivers and stuff. Do we see sectors like reg tech and insure tech uh, lagging a bit behind? And is that by design or is it by accident? And do you see a specific reason that uh, these two parts get much less attention? Is it because they're less capital intensive or any specific factors you see as an investor driving this uh, fact? And Doug, I'll start this one from you. Okay. Um, I would simply argue, in my language, you say you have to have a horse in front of the carriage and not the other way around. And I think that applies here too. So the way we think about industry and fintech is really a support function to the economy, right? It's like water and it should be everywhere and it should be accessible anywhere. And that doesn't apply only with lending, but any financial product, right? So we are a support function as an industry, really. And sometimes we, I think, we get ahead of ourselves and we're a little bit like a fintech geek mafia globally and we get very excited about this but in the end we have to remember number one it's not digital only it's there's a physical world and number two um we have to have a horse in front of the wagon so the real economy has to really really start first and then fintech second the same is also in fintech the segments yes a lending goes a lot closer and a lot more real with a transaction than let's say Insurance. Insurance is usually a lackluster product where you have something to insure, you have built wealth, you have built your loss of income is extremely dangerous to you, etc. So I think it's also a question of the market you are active in. Um, but insure tech and insurance is certainly a huge benefactor of um, of uh, COVID. I mean, one of the first thing I did was in January check all my insurances. To be honest. 
So, and I'm, I'm sure a lot of folks who were not insured previously are, are seeking insurance. So I think, and then reg tech comes even after that, right? As financial processes mature, then regulation comes on and, and you, you start, if you, if you impose it too early, you simply hamper the growth of an overall ecosystem. That, that's how I think about it. Obviously, if you're in a very mature market like Japan or Germany, you would, you would think from the reg tech first these days. Especially after the wire card. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely, thank you. Thank you. I would like to summarize that uh, we see that there is a broad spectrum of uh, challenges and opportunities. Both some sectors will continue to benefit. Some sectors will take a bit of time to realign, uh, and we see a lot more graduation towards more mature companies. While new sectors will start to build up, and that's something which all our founders uh, and listeners can look forward to. I'd like to thank all of you for your time. Really appreciate it. Looking forward to meet in person for the next version. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Ms. Mittal. Thank you to all the panelists for this very enriching and a very amazing session. I think each one of us is going to make some of our key learnings from the session. I would also like to take this opportunity to thank our valued partners, Credit Watch, Ibautech, UK Government, SBI Mutual Funds, Bank of India, OnGo, and iDesign. I would also request the panelists and all the attendees to now break for a small, small break and then move on to the next session. And I would request all of you to please visit our exhibition space, which has over 70 exhibitors. There are some really awesome offerings and some really exciting prizes lined up. Thank you and stay tuned. Thank you so much. <laughs>